Present altitude shows 40 miles. Now we are into the blackout period. 22 minutes. The blackout period, as you know, is a period when uh, this intense heat. Spacecraft is almost directly over Houston. And this intense heat burning off that uh, ablative uh, shield, synthetic shield, uh, causes an ionization uh, that uh, the radio waves will not penetrate, and therefore a communications blackout during this uh, period of maximum uh, stress uh, coming into the atmosphere. In this drop from 400,000 to around 100,000 feet. Blackout period the lasts blackout about five period minutes. is predicted for 27 minutes and seven seconds after retro fire. Would be about three to uh, would be about four minutes from now. This honeycomb shield, uh, which is our heat shield, built of a form of fiberglass, and as far as I know, is still a secret uh, formula to the United States, brings the spacecraft back in a far uh, more handsome condition and neater condition than do the, uh, does the heat shield on the Soviet spacecraft. Uh, this report has been privileged to see some pictures of the Soviet spacecraft uh, as they have been recovered uh, in the fields. They land on Earth, as you know, and uh, they... After a look at the data, Gene Kranz, the flight director's assessment of the retro fire was, it looks like we had a pretty good one. He's quite satisfied with all the data he's seen, the reports from Hawaii, additional tracking from White Sands, and we look like uh, quite a nominal reentry at this point. We're about 10 minutes away from splash. Three minutes away from the end of blackout period. A nominal reentry, that's good news. Means everything looks like it's working normally. Presumably splashdown will be uh, in the footprint. Although as we reported to you a moment ago, the shortly after they announced that the 400,000 foot level and the blackout uh, were being reached at uh, period several minutes after the original flight plan, the WASP turned and started steaming at 22 knots uh, at 185 degrees, which is almost due south, a little bit uh, west of south. Sounded as if uh, their ground plot here of the radar plotting of the position of the spacecraft indicated it was not going to land exactly on target, but uh, certainly uh, no concern about uh, it being very far off. So we were saying those Soviet spacecraft, which are almost round, almost like balls. We're two minutes away from the end of blackout. When they uh, get through reentry, uh, they've got all sorts of strings of material hanging out of them that look like uh, uh, look like long strings of burned asbestos, quite badly charred, quite tattered. Our heat shield. Uh, blades burns off there at a very even rate. Present altitude about 30 miles. At a very even rate. It's a great ball of orange, red, some blue fire that the uh, astronauts see out of their uh, the windows, the hatches of the spacecraft. Apparently it's quite a sight. John Glenn, the first American to come back from space, uh, reported it rather graphically as he returned. He giving a test pilot's typical play-by-play uh, -play report, perhaps a little more than typical. Uh, here's the recovery plot room this at the Mission Control in Houston. One of the quietest periods during any given mission. And today's uh, flight is certainly no exception to that precedent. I don't know uh, whether we can make out anything on that uh, plot. Uh, Flight dynamics again assures us that all the re-entry tracking data looks uh, very close to the nominal. That's an MSK picture. We're advised 
says that the WASP now has established radar contract, radar contact with the spacecraft. The spacecraft is through the blackout period. We've got a radar contract at any rate. Should be hearing shortly from the astronauts themselves that they have uh, survived the re-entry in good shape. 27 minutes, 16 seconds into the flight. And the Cape Downrange down range stations have acquired a signal from the spacecraft. A beacon, still no voice contact. Neil Armstrong has put in a call. And Tom Stafford uh, is advising that everything went well throughout the blackout. He advises that he's doing another left roll. He's pulling four Gs. We don't notice any change in his voice level, even under that G load. So Stafford and Cernan are through the blackout. Now the opening of the parachutes, the last critical function of this flight that began the last Friday morning at five minutes, 35 seconds to predicted splash. You see the simulation in St. Louis of the board. Rapidly spinning Spacecraft uh, is about at 50,000 feet to the point where the drug sheet should be out. Our simulation shows the drug shoot out. We hope to have confirmation it has come out any moment. Twenty-nine minutes, it's retro fire. Still waiting to hear that drogue. The drogue shoot. is out. The drogue's Stafford out. Stafford confirms that the drogue shoot has deployed. Sounds like Stafford and Cernan are, while they're very busy, are teasing us a little bit. They're taking uh, an extra few seconds. And to um, one of the downrange aircraft now is in communication with Germany 9. The prediction from the spacecraft is they will be two and a half miles long. Gene Cernan had just advised one of the downrange aircraft, two and a half miles long. Two and a half miles long. That's Four minutes and 15 seconds from splash. That's practically down the stack, but if it's two and a half miles long, it would account for uh, the wasp moving south. Actually, should have been moving a little more southeast and southwest, which was the direction we were given. 30 minutes since retrofire, we're coming up on main chute deployment. <laughs> Stafford and Cernan, now, uh... Gene Cernan, Cernan now revises his estimate. 3.3 miles long, he indicates. I think you could hear that voice coming through uh, from Houston. You could hear Cernan in the background as uh, Paul Haney picked it up off the speakers in the master. And meanwhile, Gene Cran suggests here, as soon as that main chute drift uh, takes effect, it'll probably bring the, uh, it'll revise Gene's estimate. Now, our simulation shows the opening of the main chute, which should be taking place right now. We do not have confirmation yet from Houston, expecting a moment. The WASP, uh, you see there by our live cameras, has a radio touch uh, with the uh, 30. spacecraft. 31 minutes since retro fire. And uh, since the wind is from the east, the uh, betting here is that the the easterly wind will float the spacecraft right back to the aiming point. We'll see how this comes out. They've got... Uh, what was that We've had the uh, loss of uh, signal from the Cape stations as the spacecraft is now down very close to the water. We did not get a confirmation on main chute. We can see it. There it is, a brilliant, bright, orange There parachute. you see it. It is directly in front 
of the aircraft carrier. This must be certainly the closest any astronaut, either in the Mercury or the Gemini program, has come to a recovery ship. The first time we've ever seen one dropping directly with a parachute ahead, like that. Ahead of the carrier. There is some haze in the air so that the bright orange is somewhat muted. But we can see below that lovely orange semicircle a tiny dot. And as we close on it and get closer and closer, that dot will grow. For that dot is the spacecraft Gemini 9. Within it, astronauts Stafford and Cernan. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of sailors, members of the crew of the Wasp, now running forward directly to the bow of the carrier where the big number 18 is inscribed on its flight deck. Hayes now partially obscuring the site. It's difficult to pick it up again, but it's out there and it's within sight of the carrier. And many of the members of the crew of the Wasp give thumbs up. We had word earlier today that the command pilot of Gemini 9, Lieutenant Colonel T.P. Stafford, had sent a message to Captain Gordon Hartley, the skipper of the Wasp, and the message was this. Put the big ship in the landing point. I'm fixing to land. And land he is, landing exceptionally close to the Wasp. And uh, undoubtedly, he will end up closer this time than he did the previous occasion of his visit to the Wasp, when uh, Stafford was uh, the pilot on the flight of Gemini 6, and the command pilot was Walter Schirra. At that time, GT6 landed about 13 miles from Wasp. Uh, closer than that was GT-7. Two days later, they came within 12 miles of Wasp. But it looks as though Lieutenant Colonel Stafford and... <laughs> the big ship in the landing point, I'm fixing to land. And land he is, landing exceptionally close to the Wasp. And uh, undoubtedly, he will end up closer this time than he did the previous occasion of his visit to the Wasp, when uh, Stafford was uh, the pilot on the flight of Gemini 6, and the command pilot was Walter Schirra. At that time, GT-6 landed about 13 miles from Wasp. Uh, closer than that was GT-7. Two days later, they came within 12 miles of Wasp. But it looks as though Lieutenant Colonel Stafford and uh, Eugene Cernan are going to beat that record today and come down much closer to the carrier. Stafford has uh, advised and Mission word Control. Is passed on board the carrier now that the spacecraft is just a touch off the starboard side of the carrier and is just above the water. Splash down. We say there is considerable haze out there. There has been all day, and the weather for a while was thought to be a problem. Uh, I'm putting binoculars on it, trying to pick out the spacecraft or that orange parachute. I cannot see the spacecraft or the parachute, but I do see the swim, swim helicopters now deploying very, very low. There it is on the water. The very capsule is on the water. Indeed, so it may well be that Gemini 9 has now touched down. Apparently we're seeing more than Bill Ryan is on the WASP itself with our cameras. Already occurred. Two helicopters very wasp. close to the water making... Bill Ryan cannot see what we can see uh, on the deck of the carrier. We can see on our television cameras, on this picture with long lens uh, on the television cameras relayed through satellite, we saw the splashdown, the actual splashdown with the collapse of the parachute, certainly a first. Prime helicopter is now very, and now very you see the helicopter coming over to the uh, to the spacecraft. Lieutenant Dennis Bowman is two enlisted men, Roger Bates and Dan Fraser, should be in the water right now with the flotation collar. Stafford almost certainly will stay in the spacecraft now. He messaged from the uh, spacecraft that he intended to do so. And uh, he certainly, uh, I should think, will, unless they have some trouble since Splash, and there's no indication of that yet. It's a mile and a half off the starboard bow of the Wasp. A mile and a half from the Wasp. So it looks as though Stafford and Cernan will come aboard. It looks as though they will be able to remain within their spacecraft. Well, McNamara better be prepared. The Navy and NASA are going to ask for landing pads for spacecraft on these aircraft carriers. Using binoculars now, They're I'm getting it right to down to target. Whether the swimmers have been deployed and whether the collar is now being affixed. 
to the spacecraft. Still waiting word, too, that uh, Lieutenant Bowman has used the telephone and plugged it into the side of the spacecraft and has uh, established communication with astronaut Stafford concerning.